Hello everyone. My name is Diva Taylor and I'm a second year PhD student at UM's Abbott Center for Ecosystem Science and Policy. This presentation is going to be focusing on how an expansion of organic production can help buffer Florida's agricultural industry against some of the impacts that climate change is expected to create. I'm going to start off by talking about agriculture here in the state and then moving into an overview of how climate change is going to affect the industry. I'm then going to go into some key terms, including resilience, organic production, and food sovereignty, and why they're important to define in this specific context and how they can help guide policy and practice. I'll then lay out the current status of organic production in Florida and some key challenges that we need to address and finish with some opportunities for improving our agriculture industry. So why exactly is it important to talk about agriculture here? A lot of people don't realize that Florida is actually a major agricultural state, not like California or the Midwest Corn Belt, but agriculture is our second largest industry here after tourism. It brings in over $100 billion in revenue and provides over 2 million jobs. We're also a major source of fresh produce to the country during the winter season because of our tropical and subtropical climate. In fact, the winter season is our most productive one here in South Florida because of just how hot our summers are. And how exactly is climate change going to affect agriculture? Some of our challenges will be similar to those that other agricultural areas in the United States will be facing, but some will be unique to us because we're tropical. We've got relatively poor quality sandy soil and our groundwater resources are so vulnerable to sea level rise. In terms of temperature, we are expected to see increased temperature in the coming decades, although not as much as most of, other, most of the other parts of the country. Regardless, increased summertime temperatures could pose a big problem for agriculture in South Florida because many crops that we grow are already being grown at or near what is called their temperature threshold. This means that beyond that threshold, crop yields start to decline. Several major crops have their threshold right around 89 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which as those of us who live down here know is pretty much our daytime temperature in the summer. Changes in precipitation patterns is another effect of climate change that we're going to start seeing affect crop growth. We'll have more frequent droughts and more severe rainstorms, especially along the coasts. This is a huge problem because our sandy soils do a very poor job at holding water during times of drought, which means we'll need to rely more on irrigation, putting pressure on our state's water resources. Severe rainstorms and associated winds can damage crops and fruit trees, leads to soil erosion, and leaches nutrients from the soil into our vulnerable waterways. Sea level rise will degrade our freshwater sources. And finally, with increased heat and humidity, pests, weeds, and crop diseases are expected to flourish, which can decimate agricultural yields. With all that being said, it's extremely crucial that we start building resilience now before these effects start to become really severe. Of course, resilience is one of those words that gets thrown around a lot and can mean a lot of different things depending on the context it's being used in. It's often thought of as this idea of bouncing back from some kind of shock, which doesn't address the reality that many systems that need improved resilience should actually be bouncing forward through significant transformation. The, def the definition that I think is most applicable here from, is from a paper published in 2020, which defines agroecological resilience as an emergent property of complex systems, which allows the system to buffer, to adapt to, and most importantly, to innovate and to be transformed, not only in response to the specific points of tension, but also to continuous and inevitable biophysical and social changes in the environment. I highlighted those verbs, buffer, adapt, innovate, and transform because I think they're especially relevant to how organic production will actually help improve agricultural resilience to the long-term ecological stressors posed by climate change. My argument here is not that organic is going to magically stop all the negative impacts of climate change, but that it will help buffer crop production against those impacts. 
Now, when I talk about organic production, I'm not referring solely to USDA certified organic, but rather to a broader set of practices that can simultaneously be described by terms like organic, sustainable, regenerative, or agroecological. There are, there are some common practices that tend to be very different from what conventional industrial agriculture in the US uses. Rather than acres upon acres of monocrops, organic agriculture uses diversity to its advantage. Diversity in the types of crops grown, when they're grown, and how they're grown together have positive effects on soil health, water use and quality, and pest and weed control. Rather than relying on synthetic fossil fuel-based fertilizers and pesticides, organic agriculture relies on natural fertilizers like manure and compost and biological pest control. Rather than spraying broad action weed killer, organic agriculture may prevent weed growth with cover crops or by hand pulling them. So now that we've heard about the impacts climate change will have on agriculture and what exactly organic agriculture entails, let's pull those ideas together and have a look at how organic practices can buffer agriculture against those climate impacts. I'll start with soil because good healthy soil is so crucial to growing good healthy crops. I've mentioned that our poor quality sandy soils pose a problem when faced with prolonged droughts and intense storms because our soil doesn't hold water very well and can easily be eroded by wind and rain. Organic practices can help improve the quality of soil by using a diversity of crops and cover crops, which not only help stabilize soil against erosion, but pull in nutrients that are otherwise quickly degraded in synthetic monocropping systems. Higher quality soil holds water better during droughts, meaning farmers don't have to rely quite so much on irrigation. This lessens the pressure on our state's water supplies, which is especially important as sea level rise threatens our groundwater aquifers. And with less synthetic fertilizer additives during times of increased rain, there will also be less nutrient leaching into surface level, level waterways. In terms of increased pest and disease pressures, diversity also helps manage that through use of predatory insects and risk reduction. If you have 100 acres of one crop and a disease decimates your yield, you're a lot worse off than if you had only planted that crop on 10 acres and planted other crops, which are resistant to that disease on the remaining 90. Now, I want to pivot a little bit and bring into the conversation this idea of food sovereignty, because it's very relevant to agroecological resilience. Food sovereignty is a term that was coined by an organization called La Via Campesina, and in their words, emphasizes ecologically appropriate production, distribution, and consumption, social economic justice, and local food systems as ways to tackle hunger and poverty and guarantee sustainable food security for all peoples. I've highlighted that one phrase because organic production is much more ecologically appropriate than conventional industrial production. As you can see in these six pillars of food sovereignty here, it works with nature. Of course, there are going to be challenges in scaling up organic production in Florida to the level that we would need to truly build resilience against climate change. For one thing, less than half a percent of our agricultural land is certified organic per the USDA's 2017 Census of Agriculture. Slightly more than that is grown organically, but not certified. As of 2017, we were only 32nd in the nation for percentage of farms that are certified organic, and that's actually a decrease in rank from 2012 when we were the 28th state. Along with that, there's not much empirical research on organic production in Florida, especially in South Florida. There's a little bit more up north and in Central Florida because of the University of Florida, which tends to do most of our agricultural research, but there's definitely not much down here. Then of course, there's the problem of cost. For farmers, organic usually yields higher prices, but on the consumer side, those higher prices can prevent people with lower incomes from being able to afford organically grown food, which limits the market and poses a social equity problem. 
policy needs to take this mismatch into account if we want to increase the size of the organic market. Organic certification can also be very costly, although there are programs through the USDA to help offset some of that cost, and those should be scaled up and made easier and more appealing to farmers who want to pursue certification. Finally, organic agriculture can be knowledge and labor intensive. I actually hesitate to necessarily call this a challenge because if you remember back to those six pillars of food sovereignty, um, this can actually be an opportunity to build knowledge and skills, which was one of those six pillars. So just to sum up the main takeaways from this presentation, Florida's second largest industry, agriculture, is very vulnerable to multiple climate change impacts. In order to build agroecological resilience to buffer these impacts, we need to quickly transition from industrial conventional agricultural production to organic production practices that build diversity and work with nature. Policy can help incentivize farmers to make this transition and knowledge building can help them succeed and build an agricultural industry that works within a food sovereignty framework. And finally, support organic. Thank you so much. Good morning to everybody. And I'm very glad to be here with you sharing this uh, seminar with you organized by the University of Miami I would like to thank them for their invitation to participate. I'm going to talk about food security in Mexico in the last years. And I will start first of all with some thoughts on food security and climate change. Climate change is becoming a key factor to determine the income of Mexican producers and for food security. There are some processes of adjustment in planting patterns in crops in infrastructure investment, in new technologies, and in the use of climate information to ease, to ease negative impacts. Nevertheless, this is not happening in all regions and are generally individual efforts, inefficient and not sustainable on the long run. The next chart, I'm showing the prevailing conditions for good production during 2020. We are having drastic changes in public policies, giving priority to direct money transfers and going back to target prices for basic food products. On the other hand, support programs for medium and large producers were canceled due to corruption and revisiving. We have seen some negative impacts on food production and distribution, but there has not been any shortage of Food is available for the internal market and our exports are not having any problems to reach their markets. On the side of the demand, we foresee important changes in its structure and composition due to some shortages of specific products, rises in prices, or mainly because of falls in family income. <clears throat> but it must be clear now that people already below the line of food access security in Mexico is in a worse situation. Coneval, the institution that is in charge of evaluating poverty in Mexico, is reporting that people with an income below the line of extreme poverty after 2020 can be increasing between six to 10.7 million people. In the next chart, we have the evolution of the relation between basic rate imports and the national consumption. So how much of the consumption we import in Mexico? We can see in the graph for the that index of that relationship for corn, wheat, beans, soybeans, rice, and so on. And as you see, we have a minimum here of 35% and a maximum here of 46%. The average is more or less near to 40%. But the trend, as you see, is growing, and Mexico needs to work a lot to reduce imports. The, the table below is for two, year 2020, and we have sales sufficiency for white maize. But we imported 17 million tons for the meat industry and industrial use. In 2020, the subordination for all grains was 45%, as you can see, 
in line with the increasing trend. In the next chart, we are going to show the evolution of gross domestic product in Mexico from 2015 to 2019. Mexican economy had a poor behavior, an average near to 2% between 2015 to 2018. But it had a fall 0.5% in 2019 without the negative impacts of pandemic at that time. In AP for 2020 is estimating a global fall of 8.5% and a GDP per, per capita falling near to 20%. But as you can see, the primary sector, the one in yellow, has a growth of 2% in the year 2019 and also in 2020. The next chart shows the evolution of food balance trade for the period 2015 to 2020. It's a very impressive evolution. The surplus in the green line goes from $1,117 million to 12000 347 million dollars. This is due to several factors: high quality of food products, increased productivity, highly competitive prices, all-year availability, and comparatively low logistic costs for our products to reach the market in the United States. <clears throat> in this chart, I'm showing the probable impacts on agricultural producers due to COVID and economic crisis. The first three groups are a very high risk producer group. The, the, the most affected is field workers or we call it for Daneros, with no access to land. The other also very affected is, is the producers for self-production or, or out of consumer, what we name it. And the, the other three, the other, the, <clears throat> the last of these group is the small land farmers that we call mini industries also very affected. The other two groups, the commercial and the export producers have better resources to <clears throat> have a better uh, behavior in, in the prices. The next chart shows the basic result for target prices in 2019. The main findings of this program was a recommendation from Conneval and the audit of the Federación. The main <clears throat> recommendations were the program could not demonstrate positive impacts on producer income, increased production, and reducing imports. They do not have a proper methodology to establish target prices. They need to prove the producer's eligibility to avoid simulation. They have to work on a better price estimate for size of subsidies and maintain their operational costs on the control of the 5% as authorized because costs went to a percentage of 14.2 over budget that year. And they have to work on a complete accountability of budget expenses because 43% could not be credited correctly. In the graphic, we can see in the upper graphic, we see in the product of maize, we see a very low penetration in volume, 6.8, and a big difference in prices, 37%. As a contrast in wheat, we have high penetration of 55, and a big difference as well of 40%, near to 40% in the target prices and the rural prices. And <clears throat> this, in, in both cases, we are not showing uh, very, impacts on production and productivity. The next chart shows the, some considerations for another priority program of the new administration in Mexico that's called Production para el Start, but it's a new conceptualization of the Procampo Proagro programs, looking to amend previous defects as high reversibility and adding some better qualities as territorial focus natural resources protection, and to promote agroecological techniques. Uh, following this idea, the Mexican government recently published a decree to ban in a four-year period the chemical herbicide, glyphosate, perhaps a very uh, uh, wide use here in Mexico, with the commercial producers. <clears throat> the program 
is oriented to small farmers with less than 20 hectares land size that are producing corn, wheat, beans, rice, sugar cane, and coffee. The goal for year 2020 were to support 2 million small producers and 6 million hectares with a total budget of 11,000 million pesos. The program, as I see it, has a correct strategy and the challenge is that the technical assistance covered the majority of producers and can be maintained in the long term, being accompanied with some public groups as infrastructure, research and development for agroecological practice, financing and access to target prices and or access to regional market. If these ambitions are not met, the risk is that the program could be limited to cash transfers with little impact in the income for producers and in reducing food imports. In the next chart, we, we can see the example of some producers that are trying to adapt to climate change. These are, this is the case of these organic soybeans producers in Sinaloa that are using a crop management through minimum tillage to a biological control of plagues, weeds, diseases, and so on produce. Instead, of using herbicides and pesticides. It's meant for the spring summer cycle and they have organic certifications. As a whole, they could plant in 2019 near to 400 hectares. In the next chart, we can see in the same state of Sinaloa, uh, an example of some producers that are growing maize. Uh, they use soil preparation with micro microorganisms and soil improvers soil analysis and the use of organic fertilizers, especially irrigations and usage of drone for foliar non-chemical pesticides, as you can see here in this picture. <clears throat> Seeds are produced by them, trying to, to, to induce the plant resistance to draft and high temperatures. The yield is close to the mean of the estate of 11 tons per hectare and speed savings around 25% of total costs. In the next chart, we can see an organic orange orchard in the subtropical region of Veracruz. The orchard size is 16 hectares, certified as organic. They use compost instead of chemical fertilizer. They harvest a total of 1,300 hectares of original total of 160,000 hectares. Uh, penetration of 0.8%. The fundamentals of organic production in soil conservation and improvement in compost, development of local biodiversity, tree nutrition and wood cleaning and pruning, and plants and diseases with biological management. They also use coverteras, as you can see here, beneficial weeds, and implies high usage of labor. They claim an important increase in yield to 37 tons per hectare and better prices for the organic conditions. In the next chart is the last example that I have with me right now, and it's a banana producer in the tropical region of Chiapas. Of Chiapas. They are using agroecological practices and obtain an increase in yield near to 10%. They, have, they are using <clears throat> compost, they use also 100% soil covertera with a weed that is called orejeta to fix nitrogen and humidity on the soil. They do not use chemical herbicides. It's essential for them, as you can see also here in the picture, to have a good irrigation and drainage systems due, due to the high rainfall they have in that area. And in the last chart, I would like to mention briefly the main challenges for the future. To increase food production to cover demographic growth and reduce imports, but considering changing to agroecological techniques for soil and water conservation and the usage of the small producers' potential. Uh, to be successful in this objective, it requires massive technical assistance, increasing public goods, financing, and public policies to reduce risks from climate change. Uh, there are some new definitions needed for public policies for agriculture in Mexico. For example, we need to support research and development for varieties of seeds for climate change adjustments, 
the agroecological, promote agroecological practices, increase irrigation efficiency, renewable energy production and supply for field activities for Mexico in this field is going backwards, availability of market information, market access for remote producers, good sanitary practices, food traceability, federal support for risk insurance, and as a whole, public policies must have first, a long-term vision, second, multi-year budget, and third, clear rules for agricultural support programs. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. We, we had some terrific uh, points raised by Diva on organic farming. That's going to have a huge impact on, on, on the environment. This whole conference is about environment. Everybody in the audience almost certainly is some kind of an expert on the environment or has big concerns about the environment. Certainly some of the things she raised are worth following up. Uh, we all knew we only had 15 minutes and they've been forced to compress years and years of knowledge and research into this tiny little thing. Every every sentence practically that Diva said you can expand on. So let's see some questions so we can have some fun here. Um, and the same idea goes with Jaime. He's, um, he's in a country with nearly 130 million people. He's got enormous uh, uh, agricultural issues to deal with. Mexico, as we all know very vividly, is right on the border. Uh, or let's say we're on the border of Mexico. Um, and uh, 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 what happens in Mexico matters to what happens in North America. Uh, so we all have a big interest in this. Uh, and many of us are Latin America Americanists anyway. So, so you have a, a further interest. So let's get some questions in there. Uh, because these are people we're not going to get together every day at the soda shop. We've got a panel of great experts, and let's, let's work them over. Let's get them to say some ex exciting things more than they've already said. Now, Enrique, it's time to hear about tourism, and please, Shannon, take it away. My name is Enrique de la Madrid. I'm the General Director for the Center of the Future of the Cities of the Tecnológico de Monterrey a prime uh, Mexican private university. Uh, also very happy to hear to be here with you in this uh, Coastal Resilience Symposium. And I thank very much uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Julio Frank, uh, Gabriel Garcia, and Eduardo Pesquera for this invitation. And now I would like to share uh, with you a presentation. And uh, I understand that, that after this presentation, we will also have the opportunity to to have some uh, questions and answers. So I will share this presentation. There's no doubt that there has been a lot of progress in humanity. Uh, there has been a significant growth of the GDP of the world, but also the population has grown at a dramatic pace. Uh, during the last 70 years, the population has grown from 2.5 billion people to 7.5 billion people. And again, this has brought a lot of, of progress to humanity, but at the same time, there has been a, a significant cost to our ecosystems and to the life across the world. In consequence, the nature is reacting in a hostile world away to humankind. We are already facing uh, many events that are related precisely with this excess of the use of nature. Acceleration of the melting of the polar ice caps, more frequent and aggressive tornadoes and hurricanes, sea level rise and floodings in Florida, Mexico, and the Caribbean countries, wildfires in California, Australia, and the Amazonian, increasing demand for water and recent record setting drought conditions, and, and recently the risk of outbreaks of infectious disease, such as COVID 19, resulting from the ecosystem changes. I have been reading uh, many articles where many people uh, believe that the, uh, that the happening of the COVID has to do with the humans every day reaching farther uh, toward places that were in, inhabited, uh, were not inhabited by human beings. And now we are closer to this type of virus that we were not before. Last year was one of the worst years for tourism. 
more than one billion people stopped traveling around the world. <clears throat> International arrivals dropped by 74%. There were estimated losses of 1.3 trillion of export revenues coming from tourism. And between 100 and 120 million direct tourism jobs are gone or at risk. And many experts believe that it will take up to even three or more years to uh, reach the levels before the pandemic uh, existed. In Europe, for example, they recorded a 70 percent decrease in arrivals, suffering the largest drop in absolute terms with over 500 million fewer international tourists uh, in the year of 2020. Tourism is also being affected or influenced by digitalization in the world. And some of the effects are positive, but also some of the effects are negative. Among some of the positive effects is, for example, the use of, uh, of platforms such as Expedia uh, or bookings that make every day easier for us to precisely to book a trip, to <coughs> reserve an airplane or a, or a hotel, and that is making life easier for us. But at the same time, this digitalization brought, for example, the possibility of working from home or the possibility of having conferences like the ones we're having today from precisely from our computers. So many of the uh, many of the trips that took place uh, in tourism, many precisely of the of the meetings that took place precisely because of business, I believe that those meetings will never reach the level that they that they exist that existed in the year 2019. So digitalization on the one hand is helping people to travel more. But on the other hand, also digitalization is helping us to rationalize many of our trips. And in the short term, at least this is also what some of the experts are saying, uh, the, the business classes of the airplanes are the ones that are being most affected. And those are precisely those uh, areas that have the highest revenues in the, in the, in the um, airplane industry. One of the, the most challenging uh, events that we're now facing is precisely climate change. And, and this could be our last opportunity to face it. According to the, Dr. Mario Molina, Mexican awarded Nobel Prize in Chemistry, climate change is the biggest challenge to our generation. And he believes that we have no more than 10 years to reverse its catastrophic effects. So I really believe that sometimes this, uh, this pandemic that we're now facing is more like a training in both, in both senses. On the one hand, for us to realize that we are now working in a different world where digitalization is the norm, but also that we could be facing uh, phenomena like the ones we're already feeling and living, like fires, like the melting of the polos, like uh, many of the phenomena that are now affecting the world, but all of them at the same time. Uh, we're already having, for example, a more frequent and aggressive meteorological phenomena. Uh, we're also having a significant increase in migration, precisely because many of the areas of our, of our countries, uh, and especially in the rural areas, could, could not be cultivated anymore. So many of the people that are now migrating from Africa, for example, to Europe, or from Central America uh, through Mexico to the US, have uh, as its main origin, climate change. Uh, we have now more arid and extreme climate, and also the sea level is rising. And we are also, we are also now facing the possibility of tropical diseases now appearing in northern countries, which is an event that has not happened as of today. I was talking already about more aggressive meteorological phenomena. And in the year 2020, uh, already broke records on tropical storms in the Atlantic Ocean, which affected the Caribbean region and its economy. For example, in the case of Mexico, we had a huge flood that affected the state of Tabasco. Uh, and of course, the consequence is an important increase of poverty and migration. 
And global warming will rise the, the sea level and push the coastline a kilometer or even more. And this scenario will be catastrophic for, for states such as Florida or Louisiana, uh, same as the Yucatan Peninsula, and the countries of uh, the Caribbean, which basically are islands and that they believe uh, and they live from tourism. This, this uh, graph is really amazing because it says that according to climate.gov, uh, sea level has risen 21 to 24 centimeters since 1880. And the rate of the sea level rise is accelerating. And it has more than doubled from 1.4 millimeters per year throughout most of the 20th century to 3.6 millimeters per year in the last 15 years. And in many locations along the U.S. coastline, high tide flooding is now 300 to more than 900 percent more frequent than it was 50 years ago. So this is already happening. This is not, nothing that is just a scenario that we're forecasting. This is already happening. And unless we really stop it, the consequences are going to be terrible. Even if the world follows a low greenhouse gas pathway, global sea level will likely rise at least 0.3 meters above 2000 levels by the year 2100. But if we follow a pathway with high emissions, which is the one that we have as of today, a worst case scenario of as much as 2.5 meters above 2000 levels by the year 2100 cannot be ruled out. And in this case, this is really a catastrophe. A catastrophe for many states, for many people, and no doubt that for tourism. Because tourism is basically around the world, a tourism that has to do with, with visiting our beaches and going to the sea. So according to some experts, around 60% of tourism precisely was tourism that traveled to our coastlines. Another phenomenon that is taking place in, in the Caribbean mainly is the appearance of sargassum seaweed. And many experts also believe that it has to do with deforestation and the excessive use of fertilizers uh, among the, the main factors that are driving this growth. Data confirms that it, will, it could signify a new normal by increasing year by year, affecting the ecosystems across the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. And of course, it's not pleasant for you to go to one of these places, to one of these coastlines, to one of these beaches, to have a great time and to face with the, with the event of having to, to, to live with a sargasso. Uh, I've been there. It is smelly. It is unpleasant. It is, it is harsh on the skin. It is an experience that you really do not want to have. But it is here again. Also, it has to do with the excess of the use of fertilizers and also climate change. So I was saying that for our region, for, for Florida, for Louisiana, for, for Mexico, for the Yucatan Peninsula, for the Caribbean, I mean, we're really facing a, a dramatic phenomena and it's something that is already happening today. So, and again, we should also keep in mind that tourism is responsible for around 8% of the uh, global greenhouse uh, emissions, but it also explains around 9% of GDP in most countries. So what should we do if, uh, with, with, this, with respect to these cases? What can we do in terms of resilience? My main message is that the tourism sector, and, and, and mainly that that is living in the coastline, is the one that is most to suffer. So they really have to become champions, champions, worldwide champions, uh, in, in order to promote the combat of climate change. Even though they explain 8% of the gas emissions, they cannot solve the problem by themselves. It is the world that has to change the, world, the way it is dealing with the economy and with the production. But it is tourism, the one that is most likely to be most affected. So again, it has to become a champion. It has to be a number one developer of sustainable environmental practices and policies also around the world. 
And it has also to put an example in its own destinations by having technological adaptation and enforce all renewable and clean energy, energy sources in the destinations. It should be using uh, solar energy or wind and not fossil fuels or fossil energy. It should be having a public transportation and private cars that are using renewable energy. It should be very efficient in the treatment of, uh, of, of water and how to make it uh, in, in a more efficient and more sustainable way. Uh, less massive and more high spending visitors. We also have to realize that we cannot continue to expand uh, horizontally. We also have to grow vertically. We have to adopt circular and sustainable economy models. And, and we also have to ensure social welfare, progress and prosperity for the communities around the tourist destinations. We must diversificate the already successful sun and beach tourism in our region, and we should also strengthen ecotourism and adventure travel to promote environmental awareness and provide direct financial benefits for conservation by empowering local communities. We should also empower agritourism, which involves any agriculturally based operation or activity that brings visitors to a rural facility. And and also, this is already happening because travelers are already looking for destinations and countries that take action over climate change and global warming effects. And they want uh, to reduce the carbon footprint through sustainable aviation and transportation, through smart and eco-friendly facilities. Again, ecotourism, agritourism, and adventure travel, sustainable destinations, and env environmental awareness. So my conclusion would be, my conclusion would be that since tourism is the most likely to suffer as a consequence of climate change, the tourism sector has to become the most relevant champion against climate change. It has the most to lose. It's the one that has to be champion worldwide, but also it has to become an example in each of its destinations in each of these destinations uh, to be a, an example for the visitors of the world that we could all enjoy. And we should be able to control this phenomenon because of technological improvement and also because a more sustainable conscience uh, 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 between human beings. Again, I appreciate your invitation. And of course, I'm very open to questions and answers. Thank you very much. Okay, Enrique, that was uh, another good talk. Uh, I just want to have a mic check here. Can you all hear me? Speakers, would you show me your hands if you can hear me? And Shannon, am I on the air? Okay, excellent, good. All right, well, um, we're, uh, we're starting to get questions in now. Uh, we, we've got one star question asker, and that is Joe L. Fernandez, and uh, I want him to inspire all the rest of you. <clears throat> so. Uh, I'm going to um, ask these uh, three experts uh, something to get a conversation going here. Um, I said before, this is going to be our conversation with you as the audience, and it may inspire some more questions. Um, and um, um, just put in those, fire your questions in. All right, so uh, I want to look at uh, Diva, Jaime, and Enrique on the question of organic uh, farming. Um, uh, Diva, you. Uh, laid out a fairly grim picture of the situation in organic Florida, uh, gro growing in Florida. We've got uh, uh, something like uh, half of 1% of all farm produce is organic. Uh, we're not going forward, we're going backwards. Uh, we were, uh, at one point, we were 28 in the United States, and now we're 38, probably mostly because other states are rocketing past. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, we got very little organic farming here. We know it's great for the environment. It's, a, it's, it's expensive. How are we going to get this thing going? How do we get it off the ground? Uh, and I'll follow up with some questions for the others of you. And if you have some ideas, just pop in with them, uh, Enrique and, uh, and, and Jaime. So how do we get this thing going? So uh, I think in order to increase organic production, we're going to need some 
things coming from policy, we're going to need better education for farmers. Um, and we're also going to need to sort of expand the organic market. Um, How do we do of, that? <laughs> stuff is expensive. I don't, you know, I don't yeah. buy organic stuff because I have only a few pennies. And, and we have in Florida, we have in, in Miami-Dade County, I think we have, uh, God, a huge number of people who are in poverty. It, we have neighbors and sections around here that look like developing countries. Uh, so who's going to buy it? That's a good question. Um, I haven't actually seen a lot of good policy that's been developed in order to basically make organic um, more affordable for low-income families. I know that, for example, some farmers markets that have organic small growers, um, they do have SNAP benefits available so that people who have SNAP benefits and are low income can actually use their benefits at these small farmers markets to buy organic produce. And sometimes those SNAP benefits could even be doubled so they can actually get twice the amount of food. And that's a program that I think should really be expanded throughout the state and throughout the country, really. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Jaime, any, you see any uh, thing we can talk about with the organic in, in Mexico? What, what is the situation in organic farming in your country? Well, it's growing very fast because of the markets uh, that we have, mainly for exports. But as you see in my examples, uh, <clears throat> there are some, uh, <clears throat> some, some people that is trying to convert the production of grains to organic with uh, agroecological practices. I show two examples, one of soybeans uh, produces in Sinaloa and the other ones of maize. Only to, as an example, uh, maize in Sinaloa produces for Mexico 6 million tons a year. But the people from organic, uh, it's, um, it's a very small production and it's uh, not reaching really the markets and the market is not paying the difference in between cultivating organic or traditional commercial um, maize no but i think the um, the efforts must continue with uh, public policies oriented to promote agroecological practices now for instance in mexico we have recently the a decree to ban uh, chemical herbicide for glyphosate in a four year period. And this has been a large controversy here in Mexico and also in the United States. You know, the, we import 17 million tons of maize yearly from the United States basically, and it's all non-organic, they use uh, glyphosate and the people in the United States are, are complaining that Mexico will not import any more of these 17, 17 million uh, tons uh, of, of maize. But the problem is that we don't have the possibility of producing organic maize to cover all the demand we need here in Mexico, but uh, is the uh, is the is the is the proposed is it a proposed ban on herbicides uh, uh, and or, or is it in effect and is it nationwide or a, a region? No, it's uh, it's all over the country. It's uh, it's a chemical produced by Monsanto, yeah. and <clears throat> it's widely used in Mexico, basically for. Well, for, for all crops and for, for basically for grains, in, in maize is very widely used, especially yeah. in, the, in that state of Sinaloa. Yes, it's, it's all over the country. Uh, well, isn't that going to throw a kind of a monkey wrench into farming in uh, Sinaloa? If you can't use pesticides, then the pests take over the maize, right? Well, that, that's one of the problems. And also all the, the other thing is that uh, with organic production of maize, we, we are not sure because, as, as, as Diva say, we need more research and development of the technologies needed to produce grains with organic farming, no? But if we don't have that, it will be uh, probably a, a big problem for us. But also in the United States, all, most of the maize, I'm not sure if I'm wrong, 
and Diva can tell us, but it's produced with uh, chemicals uh, that uh, mainly in, in, the, in the Corn Belt, it's uh, very high productivity, but they use chemicals and, and also genetically modified seeds, no? So if we don't have that background and this support on research and development of the agroecological techniques, it will be difficult to, to have an input impact on organic production for grains. Let's see if, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, let's no, see if any, any ideas on how to solve that problem of, 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 of increasing organic farm production in Mexico. Um, Professor, well, I think that the uh, price has a lot to do. Uh, uh, it really, it depends on how much people can pay for food. And that is why I think that uh, organics, even though it has many, many positive things, as, uh, as Ziva has explained, it is a price issue. Uh, and that is why also commercial agriculture is, is the one that is, uh, has grown the most, because at the end of the day, one of the consequences is that they are a, capable of producing more but also at lower prices. So yeah. uh, until, until price issues are really solved, it is very difficult for that market and for that segment to grow at the level that it should grow. Now, putting some perspective uh, from the tourism point of view, one of the things that I've been saying is that the tourist uh, destinations should be more sustainable, uh, should be more conscious. And so I think that they should also be producing more organic food in the tourism destinations. Uh, because probably some of the places, some of the customers could pay higher prices yeah. because they know that they will be paying for better food. So I think that um, high-end uh, tourism destinations can also focus on more organic production uh, because they will not have an issue with the price. So I think that it's, it is consistent to, to increase that type of production at a higher volume in touristic destinations where people could pay. You know, and I'm I, really, and I'm talking about tourists that could pay. Not every tourist can pay more prices. That's an idea that might work in Florida. The, uh, tourism is the big industry here. Why not feed them organic vegetables? Uh, and when you feed them organic vegetables, uh, then get them acquainted with the, with with make a brand out of it, and then you'll have a, a customer around the country, around the world. Uh, what does that sound like, Diva? I think that's a good idea. Um, we do have the fresh from Florida. Um, I guess it's like a certification that we do have down here. Um, and people do really like knowing that the food that they're eating is grown here in Florida. So maybe we could even add on to like an organic from Florida certification and that could sort of bring awareness to the idea that organic is a little bit better for our environment. Well, um, I, just, well I suggest you send an email immediately after this conference to Governor DeSantis. Uh, he's I'm a, sure he would love that. <laughs> uh, uh, Enrique, uh, you talked about uh, uh, agro-tourism. Tell us a little bit about more, uh, more about that. How can that work? And as we're listening to you, let's think about whether there might be a way to put that into Florida as well. Um, uh, I would just say we are surrounded by farms really to the south of Miami very heavily and to the west over in um, uh, Amakali, around Naples. Um, we, and, it's, and when you go to Homestead, it's, it's like another world. Uh, it's very rural. And uh, they even have people who, who have exotic pets and little personal private zoos, so you can be entertained while you're seeing the farms. Um, so, but the question on the table is agro-tourism. How does that play out? How can it... Uh, work in Mexico and how could it go around to other places? Yes, uh, I think that uh, our world is every day more urban. I mean, most, most of the people will be living in cities, big cities. It is uh, for the first time in history, more people are living in cities than in the rural sector. Uh, Mexico is a case, Mexico 75% of the population live in cities. But I think that also with the pandemic and also with these climate change uh, challenges, we're also every day more aware that uh, we should go back to nature. And, uh, and in this sense, I think we're, we are very much interested, we could be interested in visiting farms and places where they produce the food that we eat. Uh, for them, it will be also an additional income. 
uh, because uh, as a farmer, you will not only be getting money from the production of your own food, but you also be getting uh, money from tourism, from people visiting your farms. Uh, it's not the same thing, but probably if you go to a winery, you know, if you go and see how they produce uh, wine, um, I remember that in Mexico, 30% or, or sometimes up to 40% of the income of a winery came from the tourists that visited the winery, not so much anymore from the wine itself. So I think that's, that's a trend that is already happening. And that's something that we should strengthen. And it's a combination between the rural sector and tourism. Well, what if we, uh, what if you decide you want to do a tourism business with a farm in Sinaloa that specializes, maybe Sinaloa is not that good because it's not close enough to the tourists, but uh, a place where there's a lot of corn, say, uh, it, could you think of a way to entertain tourists? Would they go out and pick the corn the way we pick strawberries in some places? Uh, or, you know, couldn't you let them ride a tractor or go out and, uh, and you know, put some seeds in the ground or... I think that almost any product, that I think any agricultural product is, 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 is an opportunity because most of the people, I guess, both Jaime de la Mora and myself have been uh, close to the rural sector. He has been more than myself, but it is quite an experience to go and visit many of these places where probably people that live in cities are not aware. I mean, where do we get our meat from? Where do we get our milk? Where do we get our cheese? Where do we get uh, our fruits? So, yeah. I mean, those are not only from the market. I mean, that's, that's the, the immediate place. So going to the origin of the food chain, I think it's an event. And, and they also give you an explanation, scientific explanation. And you know, this one is natural and this is hybrid and this is uh, uh, genetically modified. And these are the differences. I think it's quite an experience and we should all be more aware of how we eat and where does it come from. It sounds very good. Jaime, it looked like you wanted to say something. Yes, uh, as an example of what um, Enrique is telling about uh, uh, agrotourism, is uh, the circuit that they made in Chiapas for the coffee farms in uh, in a very very sophisticated climate and very sophisticated places because you know those um, uh, fincas, the cafe coffee fincas were built by uh, German people that came to Mexico at the beginning of the 20th century. And they have beautiful houses there. So people um, and, uh, can be very, very happy to see how coffee is grown, how coffee is being uh, industrialized and how it's converted in what we uh, drink today. So it's, it's very, very nice to have in, a, in that environment that is uh, very, very, uh, for instance, for, for the Americans could be a very good uh, experience to you know a, a tropical climate. In, that is in, fantastic. In, I think what happens here is when this conference, uh, this session is over, stay with us and we'll see if we can get a, co a combination of investors and maybe we can start a tourist business uh, Call it something like Germany in Mexico. Come and get the finest coffee in the world and have a night in a hacienda. How about that? Here we go. So uh, we have uh, uh, some questions are starting to pour in now. Joel Fernandez uh, is asking us, um, what is a good, I want all of you to think about this, but it looks like it's aimed right at Diva. What is a good ground cover? What are the good ground cover plants that we can use in South Florida's sandy soil uh, and while you're telling us that tell us what what the whole idea of cover plants is and why anybody wants them anyway sure so a cover crop is basically something that you plant that you aren't necessarily planning to harvest and sell as a food item um, sometimes they can be harvested and fed to livestock or sometimes you just use them to prevent the soil from being bare because bare soil is really easily eroded by wind and rain. Um, so by having those cover crops, you prevent that soil erosion. And then they can also, as an added benefit, bring nutrients into the soil, um, either through the plant themselves or they may be able to bring nutrients that were deeper in the soil up to the top layer of soil. So those are the main benefits of cover crops. And I actually, I didn't know any specifics about cover crops that are used in Florida. I'm, 
actually more of a social scientist, so I don't usually go that deep into agriculture. But I did look up um, the University of Florida's extension website. Um, they do have a really great website with sort of a table about different cover crops to be used in the winter and the summer, ones that are perennial. Um, so if you want, I can actually post that link um, in the Q&A section. That sounds so I think great. That could be a really great resource. Yeah, fantastic. Um, we got uh, some more questions coming in here, so I'm going to move over to uh, who do we have here? We have uh, uh, Eduardo uh, Pesquiera, and I don't see the question here. Uh, uh, question for Enrique de la Madrid. Uh, uh, Eduardo, can you retype that question? Is for, wait a second. Uh, I, I'm not seeing it. Uh, all I see is that you've got a question from, if you could retype that question, Eduardo, uh, we have another question for Enrique from Susan Caraballo. Uh, and the question is, uh, it, it's aimed at uh, Enrique, but the three of you may have ideas, so let's all chime in in this team effort. Uh, the tr here's the question uh, from Susan Caraballo. The travel industry contributes greatly to fossil fuel emissions, especially through the airline industry. I understand they are trying to survive, but the airline industry is not helping by dramatically reducing prices during COVID times. Countries could promote local travel to minimize airline travel, but the industry will not advocate for this. This, along with many industries, becomes an issue of corporate capitalism. Okay, Enrique, unwind that one. Yeah, well, let me give you some, some uh, probably some ideas. In Mexico, 80% uh, of the income of tourism really comes from foreigners. So even though, uh, uh, even though the domestic tourism is very important, uh, international tourism is also very important for the countries. I was recently reading an article from The Economist, uh, it, it precisely recognizing that issue. Uh, as of today, no more, no more than 3% of the total gas emissions come from the air industry. No, no more than 3%. But if it continued uh, growing, yes, it could go up to 8%. So what is the solution? I think that the solution is not to stop flying. The solution is to make technological improvements. And that is, that is a comment that is, is general for everything. It's, it is not an issue of stop using, uh, for example, electricity. It is an issue of producing electricity from sustainable sources. In the case of air, air, airplanes, what they were talking about, they were talking about hydrogen and other things. So my, my point is, there's two view of things. One is to, to do less of everything, so we do not continue to produce uh, gas emissions. Or the other way to see it is, why don't we do, do things better? Uh, that contaminate and pollute less. So I, I tend to believe that technology uh, will be able to solve most of our challenges. Uh, having said that, there's no problem with countries also promoting more tourism uh, domestically. I think that in the short term, that is what is gonna be happening because of the pandemic. That is the natural course to take. But I, I hope that uh, we do not stop international flying. I just hope that we can do it in a much more sustainable way. Uh, what do you think, uh, Jaime? Any thoughts on that, or Diva? Well, yes, of course. Uh, I think Enrique is right. And we need to use better energy, uh, produce production with cleaner energy. No, we have in Mexico, for instance, we have excellent places where to produce um, um, with, uh, with the light of the sun, electricity, with the wind, or with the tides, we can produce electricity. And, and I think it's also important for the agricultural sector to produce cleaner energy. And we can use the, um, uh, <clears throat> the residues of, of agriculture to produce uh, another type of, um, of, of um, how do you call it? Um, ethanol or for instance we can use that are less contaminating uh, as a whole no? so, yeah exactly diva what do you know about that very little but i would agree with what enrique and jaime said that um unfortunately lots of people's livelihoods do 
depend on tourism. So telling people not to fly is maybe not the best option, but improving the technological developments so that flights do depend more on cleaner energy sources, I think is a really good opportunity for that. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you. Uh, here we have Eduardo Pesquiata. Uh, I can now see his question. Uh, this is uh, all three of you. Uh, be ready to pounce on this one. What are the main changes in the tourism business model being implemented by tourism corporations after the pandemic uh, or, you know, during and ending? We hope it's ending. Uh, let's, uh, let's see. What are the main changes in the tourism business model being implemented by tourism corporations uh, after the pandemic and the threats posed by climate change? Um, thank all, oh, thank all three of you. He says it's been a great presentation. I applaud that. I think it's great. Thank you for the compliment, Eduardo. Uh, and um, I think we're, okay. So, God, I've tangled this up so badly. Let me give it another shot so you can answer it. Main changes in tourism business model that are being implemented by tourism corporations uh, in reaction to the pandemic and the threats of climate change. Main changes in tourism. Well, one comment is before the pandemic, there was already some uh, people saying that we, we should be less worried about promotion of the destinations and much more worried about the protection of the destinations. Well, if that was relevant before the pandemic, I think it's much more relevant today. I had the impression that we should focus much less in massive tourism, no, in big hotels, thousand dollar, I mean, thousand rooms, hotels, and we should be much more conscious about having less, less impact in the nature. From, from the Mexican point of view, it's not, it's not so much relevant how many people visit you, but how much money they spend. Mm. At the end of the day, what is relevant is not how much money, how much people visit you, but how much income you get. And I think that the challenge is to get the most income you can with the less damage to nature. Uh, and that will imply again, I think, less massive tourism, less huge hotels that impact geographically, but a much more sustainable uh, offer. And again, with higher expenditure. Uh, and, and we should be much more conscious about also the sustainability of the places. What I said in my presentation, that we are really an example of how we use energy, sustainable energy, how we use sustainable material for construction. We should, the tourism, the tourism destination should become an example of how the world could be. So that when people visit these places, they also back home and say, this is what I can do also better uh, now that I'm here in my house. So it should be an example because they are the ones that are also facing the most challenges because of climate change. Excellent. What about you two others? Who wants to speak? Okay, that was an excellent wrap up there, Enrique. Uh, we, um, I want to ask uh, Jaime uh, about the the, uh, the the question of uh, imports. If I understand it, you have forty percent of your agriculture being imported to an agricultural country, right? Right. It's uh, <clears throat> it's basically in grains. It yeah. Changes uh, in each product, but it's basically in main grains, no? Yeah, so, so this is, must be a huge problem. It's a drag on the economy. It's a problem of national security. If somebody decides not to send you grain, you're going to be hungry. How do you deal with this thing, uh, which is not something that came up yesterday? It's been a long-running problem, I imagine. Uh, so w w how do we get at this? How do you solve this big problem? Well, first of all, uh, if it's Mexico, I don't think that uh, any nation or any region can be self-sufficiency in everything, you know. They, they must produce whatever they can in the best way with the less cost for everybody and, and be uh, uh, supply the demand with, um, with an efficient production. And uh, the need for imports and the world market is also uh, is very developed. We import mainly from the United States uh, our basic food, uh, wheat, rice, uh, beans, and maize, of course. But on the other hand, uh, we can 
and export to the United States a lot of fruits or vegetables that are not produced uh, in within this, the United States. So there must be an equilibrium of commerce in between nations and food should not be used as a political weapon. Uh, we hope that could happen uh, always, no? So we can be sure that we have sufficient food for our people here, no? Would, this, would the solution be that you keep the, uh, the grain imports at about the level they are uh, while you're trying to produce things that you can do that North America can't, like mangoes and, and bananas and uh, uh, other uh, maybe more exotic, more expensive fruits? Uh, exactly, but but mainly we, we, we have a lot of, of potential that we haven't uh, uh, really uh, uh, used in the, uh, in the south part of Mexico. For instance, to produce some rice or maize or, um, uh, and we are not developing the strategies correctly to, to produce the, to reduce imports only. It is not to be sufficient in everything at a hundred percent, but it, we must approve, uh, we, we must use the potential we have in the South of Mexico, for instance, in the tropical areas to produce grains as well. But we haven't worked on that sufficiently now here in Mexico. We need to work on that. That's the thing. It looks like a perfect place to produce a lot of grain. Why in the world is somebody not doing it? What about getting Mr. Sleem to go down there and start a farm? <laughs> well, you should ask him. <laughs> Well, no, but, but you know, business, and that looks like a great opportunity. Is, is there some hidden problem that I can't see? Why we wouldn't all want to start a farm down there? And, 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 and is it, is the, is the, is the return on the farm product not, not what uh, is needed to, to, to get into it? Well, I, I, what I can tell you is that uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of places in Mexico that are producing grain in the south, but it's not sufficiently developed, you know, uh, and we must deal in the south with uh, tropical weather, with more rain and with more uh, requirements of drainage, for instance, that is not built in place. and. Uh, I think that we should work on that. Also, what I was telling in my presentation, we need some research and development of agroecological techniques to produce more grains in the tropical areas of South Mexico. Yeah. Uh, Diva, uh, what do you know about self-sustaining uh, economies with producing enough? The, I should know this, but where, what's the general picture in the U.S.? Uh, what's our balance uh, on agriculture? We, mainly, we're an exporter, aren't we? I think so. I think we're mainly an exporter. And certainly in Florida, I think we mainly export most of what we produce here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another good question from uh, uh, Joe L. Fernandez. Um, he's interested in the population climb uh, here. I think... Uh, Enrique mentioned that uh, uh, in some very short decades, we went from 2.5 billion people to more than 7 billion in the world. Uh, and um, and uh, Joel Fernandez is saying, uh, this population keeps climbing. We need to produce more food. Uh, what can we do to bring uh, the population into a sustainable balance? Uh, that's for all three of you. Well, if I can make a comment, I think the population is now growing less. No, in many countries now it's it's even below. It's uh, how do you say they're they're uh, they're not even countries like Japan, for example, that has now 120 million people. We have 80 million in the next probably couple of decades. Yeah. So I think population is not growing so more so much anymore. But nonetheless. The, I understand that the amount of food that we should produce probably has to double no? in the next some, some, some years. So again, it's an issue of efficiency, of better technology. Uh, in this case, it has to be sustainable. 
I'm, I'm a believer in technology. I mean, I think that we have reached this stage in, in our humanity because of technology, of course, with its problems and its consequences, but technology is the only way out of, 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 our, of our problems. And uh, I also believe from what I've heard that people probably will also be changing, and Jaime knows more about this, in the combination of the things that we'll be, we will be eating, no? We're eating about the proteins that you can get from insects, no? There's every day more pressure against meat, no? Because of the very intensive use of water and grains. But there's, for me, there's no doubt that technology will be capable of helping us and assisting us to get the sufficient amount of nutrition nutrition that we need. And also because the level of, of, uh, of well-being of the people will be increasing. So people, it's not only that we are more, where every day more people are eating because the standards of, of living of people are better off. No, So we, we have more money, we can buy more. And so there will be a huge demand for food in the years to come. Um. What are the other? What have you two say, Jaime and Diva? What are your thoughts on population and managing it? Uh, Enrique did a very good job, but I'm sure you can add something. Yes, I, I think that, uh, as Enrique said, now people are concentrated in the urban areas, but the link in between the rural, we don't, we haven't put enough efforts to develop the rural areas in Mexico, as I see it. And I think that it's, uh, uh, population is, is migrating to the urban areas. And who will produce the food? That's an important question. And I think that, um, uh, that uh, we need to develop more technology for the food industry, because we, we can be short of food in the near future, if we don't take uh, uh, good support for, for those people. What's the population picture in Mexico? Uh, what Are you accelerating, holding steady, or dropping? Uh, it's still growing, but uh, a lower pace, you know? We were growing, uh, perhaps Enrique knows better, but I think we were growing at a rate of two, two and a half percent, about 30, 40 years ago, and we are now growing at a rate of 1.2, 1.5, more or less. I, 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 perhaps Enrique knows better. Yeah, I think it's around that. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's growing much less, but the base yeah. is huge, no? Just, yeah. in, just to put it in, in Mexican numbers, in the, year, uh, in the year 1950, we were 25 million people, 1950. Yeah. And today we are 126 or 25. So, yeah. I mean, it's a huge. Big growth. Big, yeah. Diva, what do you know? So I was just going to add a little bit about food waste. So I think in the U.S., the numbers are that we waste about 40% of the food that we grow. Um, and globally, a lot of research says that we actually produce more than enough food to feed everyone on the planet, but it's very unequitably distributed. So the higher income countries get a lot more of that food and the lower income countries have much less access to that. So while I do think we will probably need to intensify production in the future, I think that we also need to be a lot more efficient with our food and wasting a lot less of it. Um, and then I think Enrique also mentioned that diets will probably have to change in the future if we want to feed everyone, um, make sure that everyone has food security. Um, meat does take up a lot of land in terms of just both growing the livestock and growing the food to feed the livestock. So if we start moving towards a more plant-based diet, then we will be able to turn some of that livestock land into crop land. Very, very helpful. All of you helped our perspective on this. Your presentations were excellent. The questions went right into the meat of it and, and helped us expand on what you told us in the first round. Uh, the audience has got into the game quite a bit. This is really terrific. We're going to get a star for this panel. This is <laughs> really good. Uh, the curtain is going to drop now on this wonderful morning together. Uh, and um, uh, Shannon's going to put up a panel, and you'll see the options and where you can go next. And uh, I hope that, as, from my point of view, all of the panelists, that we'll somehow be in touch in the future. It's been a great experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Thanks, Professor. Thanks for, the, for your moderation. Very useful. Thank you so much, yes.
Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much for your moderation. Thank you. We'll see you down the road. And Shannon, thank you for an excellent job of running this show. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Shannon. You I enjoyed Shannon. working with you very much. <laughs> Uh, the audience, we still have a few of you left. We are so happy you were with us. You had so many good ideas. Uh, we wish you a great experience for the rest of the day. I'm going to say goodbye. Um, uh, happy trails to everyone. Mm -hmm.